Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. First of all, an apology. I missed two weeks in a row. I did not intend to do that. I was trying to do it every week. I was out of town. I had some personal business to attend to. And I thought I'd get time to do something really short, maybe record something on my phone, but it didn't happen. Sorry. In the future, I'm going to record a couple spare episodes to put on when I need to. This week's topic is vampires. There are a lot of vampire books out there, obviously, and they run the gamut from horror to suspense to adventure to romance to even to comedy. And I've talked to people who say, I don't like vampire books, they're dumb, or I'm sick to death of vampires. Yet, a lot of people read them, which is why writers keep writing them. Now, vampires have been done to death with series like Twilight, which I have no interest in, and True Blood, which Mrs. Desperado said is good but I haven't seen it yet. So to me, it's got to be really, really imaginative and different if it's going to be worth reading. Anyway, I was exploring the idea of vampires in steampunk, and I came across this in a list somewhere. And I'd already seen one that turned out to be erotica, and it was really stupid, and I had a great laugh at it. And I'm not going to review that one because it's just too dumb and a little too dirty for my, you know, personal brand here. But this one is good. It's called Vampire Empire by Clay and Susan Griffith. So, regarding Vampire Empire by Clay and Susan Griffith. This was first published, first book in the series was published in 2010 at the height of the steampunk boom and such it was marketed as steampunk. It takes place in the early 21st century, in fact, around 2020, and you may ask, how can this possibly be steampunk? Well, the reason is that a disaster has retarded human progress. It has caused things to be frozen in the age of steam, and there, this disaster was the Great Killing, which was an uprising by vampires who tried to take over the world and succeeded in taking over about half of it. Now I enjoy, I really enjoy it when a writer really mixes up an old mythos, for example, Night Watch. I talked about that a couple months ago, how they have the supernatural battle between magicians that are good and evil, and they had vampires in there and there was a lot of changes to it. A lot of the supernatural stuff went away. They didn't mind garlic or crosses. Those were considered to be myths and they could tolerate sunlight, they just didn't like it. At the same time, they, of course, still blank, drank blood. And, and in the same way, the vampires in Vampire Empire, that's about, just about all that's left that is true to the original vampire legend. They do drink blood. In this case, it's not a supernatural curse, and it's not a disease. Vampires are a parasitic subspecies of the human race, who had kept themselves hidden for centuries, but for whatever reason, sometime in the late 1800s, they decided to rise up and take power. I guess it's because they have all these clans, and the clans for once decided to work together, which they usually can't do, and so they pretty much took over Europe, China, Japan, and most of North America, uh, north of the Rio Grande. And they killed all humans who resisted, and the ones who survived, they kept them as herds for, for food purposes. You know, like the Eloi in the uh, Time Machine. Like they're very oppressed and very beaten down. As far as human society, they went south. Uh, and still in half the tropics, because vampires just don't like hot weather. They are stronger and tougher than humans. And they're very res resistant to pain and cold. In fact, they, their sensations of touch aren't, aren't really profound. They don't have the fine motor control so much as humans do. They have claws and teeth that they can use to kill people and to fight amongst themselves, so they don't really need to make weapons. They cannot turn into bats, but they can fly because they can control their weight. Now, the book doesn't explain it. It may be they can change their relationship to gravity, I don't know if they're affecting their own mass or anything like that, but they can lift up into the sky and travel the wind currents like a leaf or something. 
Now, how they get to go the opposite direction from the prevailing winds, they don't explain. Anyway, these vampires are occupying Europe. They haven't gone farther than the Mediterranean because they don't like that warm weather, and they're not even crazy about Italy. <laughs> They've broken them back up into squabbling clans. Now, the British Empire did survive. It relocated to Egypt. It renamed itself Equatoria, and they kind of merged with the Persians. So they have this aristocracy, which is both British and Persian. So they're kind of more of an olive-skinned people. And they are in charge of much of the tropical areas, though the United States still exists. It's headquartered in Panama now, with a lot of old school, like, southern type Americans in charge. As to the story, it's an adventure, definitely an adventure with a lot of exciting action. Never, never lost my interest, but it's also a love story. So it appeals to that audience as well. And so I think a lot of you know, men will like the adventure. A lot of women in particular will like the love story, but it doesn't get obnoxious. And it's not like over overwhelming. The two main protagonists, star-crossed lovers, of course, Adele, the imperial heir for Equatoria. She's a, a beautiful young princess, although they make pain to say that she's not the most beautiful. Because <laughs> that's just a trope. She's intelligent. And she has her own opinions and ideas. And as time gets on, she starts out at about 18 or so, and she gets more experience. She becomes more headstrong and becomes a leader. The other main protagonist is, of course, a vampire, Prince Gareth of Britain. And he is the heir to the British throne. Though he doesn't really want it too badly. He is a rebel. He believes that humans have been wronged by his people and he wants to save them. Uh, he has this persona, he pretends to be a human, called the Greyfriar, who dresses up in this cape and hat and, and mask, and he's fighting vampires with swords. There's all these villages in Europe where there's a few survivors and they're sort of on their own, and then the vampires discover and exploit them, and the Greyfriar comes in to save the day, so he's become, become a folk hero. A lot of Equatorians think he's a myth, uh, but it's really Gareth, and he actually he actually rules Scotland and with a very light hand. And, I mean, his people love him. He doesn't exploit them. In fact, they give him blood voluntarily. The humans of Scotland do. So anyway, <clears throat> the Equatorian em Empire, by the way, they're trying to make an alliance with the United States. So they want to marry off Adele to this American political leader called Senator Clark. He's a war hero. He's uh, high in the government, and he's also a boorish, narcissistic braggart. At the same time, he's not a coward. So we got to say that he's got his good, his good points. He is very, very brave. And he wants to marry Adele only because it'll give him power. He's not interested in her as a woman, even though she's an attractive 18-year-old gal who is smart and interesting and, and clever. So all these good qualities of a wife, she has them. But, you know, he's so into himself, he can't see that. <laughs> and so, he's an interesting character, too. So the characters are a really big part of this, of, this, uh, of this book. My favorite supporting character is Mamoru. He's the Japanese guy. He's a um, martial arts trainer for Adele. And he's also into this thing called geomancy, where you draw power from the earth. And it's a psychic thing. And he's very cool. Anhalt, uh, Colonel Anhalt, who is like a, a sepoy or a Sikh, I forget, but he's also, sounds like he's part German as well, which would make sense. And he's like Adele's bodyguard. Very, very loyal, very super loyal. Her younger brother, who is kind of, is kind of cool, you hear worships Greyfire. On the vampire side, we have Gareth's brother, his scheming brother, Cesare, who is trying to planning to seize the throne from Gareth uh, when their father, who's been ailing, he's like 300 years old, their ailing father dies. And so he's a very wicked character, <laughs> which, which is fun, though. And the war chief, his war chief is a woman, vampire woman, called Flay. Very tall, very beautiful, pale-skinned, blonde, with ice-blue eyes, who is the most evil, wicked, and cold-hearted being you can imagine, 
and she like slaughtered Ireland. She led the slaughter of Ireland, for example. And she runs around, they, they mention it several times, she runs around with her breasts exposed because she's a vampire and nobody's going to tell her she can't. <laughs> and anyway, <clears throat> she has the hots for Gareth, believe it or not, even though the other vampires think he's a wimp. He once fought alongside her in The Great Killing, before he had his change of heart, and she thinks she can manipulate him more so than Cesare. And so she thinks they can rule as the ultimate power couple. And so he has to kind of pretend to like her at times, but <laughs> he really doesn't like her at all because she's vicious and cruel and, and not, not anything of what he wants vampires to be. So as far as these books go, there are four of them. The three are in audiobook form, narrated by, by uh, James Masters, who does a really good job, which is a big, important thing in audiobooks. I mean, a bad narrator can ruin a book, a good narrator can make it ten times better. And the first book was The Grey Friar, of course, basically dealing with uh, Gareth's alter ego and Adele meeting and falling in love with him but thinking he's a human. <laughs> and all the stuff in behind the scenes that he has to do to rescue her from the vampires and so on, and that kind of thing. Eventually, of course, they have to find out who he really is, and Adele will find, have a really hard time accepting that. Number two is called The Rift Walker, 2013. That references geomancy and uh, Adele's growing geomantic powers. In fact, she has more power than anybody ever imagined that she would, even though these Schemers, including Mamaru, were trying to bring this blood into the royal family so that they could help defend human civilization. Third is The Kingmakers, 2014, which involves like the big sh showdown between human and vampires, and uh, Adele and Gareth teaming up as lovers, kind of secretly, because they don't want either side to know that, that they are collaborating. And Fourth is not an audiobook, unfortunately. In 2015, The Geomancer, and this it happens after that big showdown. And I just started reading it very recently because I didn't even know it existed. Because it's not in the you know the audible list, of course. Unfortunately, they ran out of steam because it was supposed to be more books, and that last one was published eight years ago, so I don't think it's gonna happen. You never know, it might. This last one was marketed as urban fantasy, probably because. Steampunk has kind of gone out of favor, unfortunately. Now, let's go with the pros and cons. Pros. Vampire Empire has all the elements of a good steampunk. We've got the historical tech. We've got adventure. We've got suspense. And romance. And uh, a lot of steampunk series are written and consumed by women these days. And they want the romance. They want the genteel manners. They want the nice... Dress. They want men who are gentlemen and heroic, rather than rather than boorish perverts, <laughs> as so many men are today. And so they've got some of that, but it's not overwhelming. It's it's not all there is. And so men who are more into adventure, they'll still enjoy it, I think. And despite that violent content, it never gets into horror, which I find kind of distasteful at times. And nor does the romance part ever get erotic and you know explicit which has its own niche but this will be more appealing to more wide audiences and so I think from YA upward I think anybody who likes this kind of story will appreciate it. The best thing is world building I love the concept the idea of this vampire empire and so on probably not the only book of this sort but they really have a switched up this played out theme. The characters are great, very memorable. I love the two protagonists, and they're very likable, and they have flaws, which is good. They're not like, you know, Adele isn't like Captain Marvel. She doesn't have, uh, you know, ultimate power. Even though she kind of a little too powerful, though. The villains are great fun, especially the evil, the wicked and sexy Flay. <laughs> uh, I also like the portrayal of the Americans. I mean, Clark is a boor, and he's a jerk, but he is brave, and his main lieutenant, whose name I forget, is a very honorable man, and when Clark crosses the line, he resigns, and he goes over to the Equatorians, and he says, this is what Clark is plotting. Because, of course, the wedding 
You may have guessed that the wedding, the planned wedding between Adele and Clark, doesn't exactly pull off because this thing with the Greyfriar. <laughs> now, on the downside, there are a few items that seem to me like plot holes. For example, Gareth's motivation to help humans. I've never quite figured out why, other than that he's a naturally good person. I mean, the vampires themselves are a bit of, a, of an enigma. Why did they suddenly decide to rise up when they were doing fine, just fine attacking people from the shadows? Why do they imitate humans despite the fact that they don't have any culture, they don't make what, technology of any sort? In fact, they're, they're more kind of like wild beasts who uh, feed off humans. They don't need clothing, they don't need uh, weapons because they're claws and teeth, and yet they have adopted human clothing and they have uh, taken over human dwellings. And, you know, a few, a few like Greyfire do use human weapons. So, I might have downplayed that and have them have a little bit of a culture so that there was a plausible reason for them to do this other than just imitation. There are also a few, like, tropish elements, the worst being that um, the female protagonist suddenly develops amazing powers. And they kind of want to make, make her equal to the Greyfire, I suppose, but it's almost like she's too powerful. Yet her powers do have limits. Her geomancy drains her and could kill her if she uses it wrong. It could also kill Gareth. Because eventually, of course, they develop a relationship, even though they have to keep it secret. And uh, her geomancy can kill vampires, and so she has to be very careful how she uses it. I would rate the first of these three books, I would rate the first 4.5 gears out of 5. Because it's really interesting and exciting, and I like the concept of the secret identity of the Greyfire. Uh, after that, he's revealed, and it's a little less interesting because of that, but I still give the next two four gears out of five. As far as the last one, I would knock it down to 3.5. I've only just started, so maybe that's unfair, but I thought it was a little weak, a little bit more tropish than the others. Like they have Adele looking in a mirror to describe how she's changed <laughs> since the last uh, three books. Anyway. Uh, nonetheless, it's a good series. I do recommend it. And that's my review of Vampire Empire by Clay and Susan Griffith. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please share any other vampire or steampunk, or especially steampunk vampire books that you might have enjoyed that I will review. Please also like and subscribe so that we can help get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.